It's been two decades from the time when the South Canyon Fire killed 14 firefighters on the slopes of Storm King Mountain in Colorado. Each spring, the Redding Hotshots wrap up their fire refresher training by leading a staff ride to the site. They come prepared, having read John McLean's book and the 1998 follow-up to the original investigation report. Some students test their fitness using the same Fireline escape route that was used in 1994. They face the reality of hiking in steep, uneven terrain and the additional challenges that being part of a large group can bring. Over the years, the fire community has come to recognize that human factors are just as important as keeping track of the fire itself. The fire is just going where the fuel, wind, and topography allow it. We are the ones that put ourselves in harm's way. It's often a sobering moment for many students when they hear the story straight from the survivors and relate to the circumstances, realizing they might have done the same thing. 20 years ago, I was one of the 49 firefighters on Storm King Mountain. Over the last year, I've interviewed 11 of us that were there. Now, we will take you through the fire as we experienced it so that you can learn from our mistakes. Colorado is in a severe drought after a low snowfall winter and a hot dry spring. An evening lightning storm starts many new fires on the Grand Junction District. One bolt strikes a ridge coming off Storm King Mountain near the town of Glenwood Springs. The small fire smoldered and occasionally torched pinion and juniper trees. That smoke is noticed by many in the area and reported to authorities. One man calls directly to the BLM Grand Junction office. He's located in South Canyon, across a river from the smoke, and dispatch, needing a fire name, records it as a South Canyon fire. And that becomes its official name from then on. At 1414, with a thundercell dumping rain in the area, a BLM engine foreman reports a dispatch that the fire is in rugged terrain and is inaccessible with the current weather. He recommends smoke jumpers and also a helicopter for water drops when conditions improve. At 1438, a plane load of smoke jumpers, a lead plane, and an air tanker are rolling out of Grand Junction Air Center towards a fire 70 air miles away. At this point, it would have been a classic initial attack use of smoke jumpers. But instead, five miles out, dispatch calls and diverts them to a new fire 55 miles away, a wind-driven Sage Flats fire that went to 160 acres that night with engines and crews on it. With local crews committed to other fires on the district, no other action is taken this day on the small, low-priority South Canyon fire. It's a fire. Today is July 4th. It's probably started by lightning a day or two ago. That's less than a half a mile from the house. Late that afternoon, during a lull in the fire's activity, Butch Blanco's BLM engine, a four service engine, and Michelle Ryerson's small hand crew arrive at the freeway. Blanco has been assigned as the incident commander, and Ryerson is squad boss. Saw it, you know, on the hillside, inconspicuous, just kind of backing itself down the hill and not a lot of fire activity. And at that point in time, we knew you know, it was going to be too late to try to get up there. The spring was very busy. I mean, I initial attacked my first fire. We went out in March and it was pretty consistent initial attack from then on. They drive to the BLM office in West Glenwood Springs to prepare for the next day and to try and get some needed sleep. Blanco calls dispatch requesting more firefighters, an air tanker, and helicopters for crew haul and bucket work, but resources are stretched thin. That evening, the fire grows to 11 acres and is estimated to be 29 acres by the morning. With no helicopter support coming, Blanco Plus 6 start the long hike up what's become known as the East Drainage. It took three hours to reach the fire. 
As you got, you know, towards the top of that, you're just on your hands and knees, you know, working your way um, to the ridge top. We get to the fire and it's just kind of skunking around and PJ grasses and that. It's just really steep, rocky terrain on the interstate side and there wasn't a whole lot we could do with that. It just wasn't worth trying to get anybody down on that side. So we pretty much concentrated on, you know, the, the top knob, getting a hell of a spot because we knew that we were going to need supplies and then try to start getting a line around it. It was pretty obvious that, you know, we were going to need some more help. An air tanker arrives, but because of downdrafts and terrain, can only make drops on the interstate side of the fire. The pilot radios Blanco that this would be a better job for a helicopter. Blanco replies, I'd love to have one. Put in a little bit of line and then our saws broke. So that pretty much, you know, ended what we could really effectively get done. And that, it was late enough in the day, it was probably, um, you know, time that we start hiking out anyways. You know, about that time we were hiking out that the first load of uh, smoke jumpers were coming in and we didn't have a face-to-face -face with them before we left. Orbiting the fire are eight Montana-based smoke jumpers. Don Mackey is jumper in charge. Also on board are Sarah Doring and Kevin Erickson. Their day had started at a spike base in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Loaded up on the plane and we flew to GJ. We landed and um, they said, we got a request for you guys, but we were gonna brief you up. I think we talked in generalities about, you know, we've been having red flag warnings every day and, and it has to do with low humidity and, and afternoon winds. You know, we'd been living with red flag warnings for weeks and weeks, and maybe we were a little, maybe I was complacent, and because uh, it just, that didn't mean a heck of a lot to me by then. You knew that it was gonna be hot and dry in the afternoon, and, and uh, you were probably gonna have some winds come up. And uh, we were all pretty happy. It was our first, um, my first fire mission of the season, and the first one in pretty much almost two years because 1993 was so quiet. We were happy to go finally get on a fire and, and it looked like, a, you know, looked like a pretty good one. And then we were all pretty stoked because we just see this, at first I couldn't even see the wisp of smoke and then the plane went around and we circled it and it was just basically a wisp of smoke coming up. We were pretty happy, high-fiving, going, all right, this is gonna be a piece of cake, you know? We're gonna jump this thing, we're gonna have it lined by midnight and it'll be a done deal. You know, we didn't recognize how steep it really was and, and uh, how big it really was over the top of that. So the spotter selected a jump spot and uh, with Don Mackey first in the door and picked one out and Don and I were jump partners. He went out first and I followed him out. And I was thankful he was first. This was only my, this was my fourth season of smoke jumping, so pretty young in my career. And, uh, and I remember opening up and looking around like, where did that jump spot go? <laughs> but I could see Don, so basically tried to follow him in. They complete jump operations, gather cargo, and hike the ridge up to the fire. Mackey scouts and calls Blanco, reporting that the fire has crossed Blanco's hand line and is now burning actively. The eight jumpers start lining the east flank. It's just scattered grass and PJ type thing and rocks. Digging was pretty easy, um, and, but as we started to go down that east side, it was pretty steep. And uh, as we worked our way around, uh, it got dark and then a lot of stuff started rolling down on top of us. I'm trying to recall who it was that almost got taken out. I don't know, I think it was, I wanna say it was Woods, but I'm not sure. And that's why we decided it was kind of a, a lost cause right now. It was, we just couldn't see the things that were rolling. I remember Don saying, well, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll pull out of here and we'll head up on top. And there's, it's not worth getting killed over here. So we uh, called it a night and hiked back up to the top and uh, made camp up there. Mackey Radio's dispatch estimates the fire at 50 acres and orders two Type 1 crews. That night was kind of one of those restless type sleeps just because of the wind. And you could hear the cars going by on the interstate and you could also hear the train. At one point I remember waking up and walking over and looking at the edge going, wow, there's, the fire did grow a little bit, you know, this is a lot bigger than it was yesterday. and. It looks like a little bigger than what we can handle right now. But yeah, I woke up the next morning and uh, Don had already been up scouting 
and I could hear him talking to dispatch on the radio. Mackey requests a helicopter for crew haul and bucket work and a plane to be an eye in the sky. He is talked into using one helicopter for everything. It was still windy that morning, so we kind of went off the edge a little bit into the trees and um, had some uh, breakfast, and that's when I took that picture. So we just chatted, and um, Don briefed us on what he had talked to dispatch about, you know, talking about our game plan for that day. It was pretty well nuked out around H1, where you felt pretty good, but all the way around it was, you know, there was no, there was no control line underneath you or anything like that. So that's why we wanted to get something up on top to start off from so we could start digging and try to flank that fire. Basically use that ridge line as a good uh, defensible starting point. Um, otherwise, we really didn't have a good starting point. Butch Blanco's crew starts hiking up the east drainage. The mixed BLM Forest Service crew now numbers 11. It had been another sleepless night for those at the BLM office. And the phones rang constantly the whole entire night. I mean, they rang and rang, so finally I picked them because I couldn't figure out why, you know, why people were, why was the office phone <laughs> ringing after hours? It, you know, it was a resident calling in, um, you know, the fire. You know, going in to the shift that day, we knew there was a cold front, but the forecast that we had heard before we left the office was that expect moisture. So we made sure that we put our rain gear um, in our PG bags. That was more on my mind than, you know, the winds and, and how it played out. Blanco makes it to the saddle area and checks in with dispatch. He learns that a hotshot crew and another load of jumpers are on their way. When we got up there, I was very surprised how big the fire had grown. And a lot of it I couldn't see. It was down, you know, the west drainage into the, the Gamble Oak. Blanco and Mackey meet for the first time and discuss tactics. Since terrain blocks most of the fire from view, they agree that they need to recon the fire from the air before finalizing a plan. Blanco's crew is to brush out the hand line that the jumpers are putting in from H1 and clear another hell of spot, H2, to fly crews and their gear in and jump gear out. Mackey flags a starting point for the jumpers to line the west flank. And then we got to the where the fire went off the west side and we were gonna dig line down there. And when we got to that point, that's where I was like, hmm, well, how do we get so lucky? Because I remember looking over the edge and just seeing that very tall brush. Helicopter 93 Romeo arrives on the scene and lands at Canyon Creek Estates to set up Helibase with their ground crew. A plane load of jumpers arrives over the fire. This load is carrying a mix of McCall, Missoula, and North Cascade smoke jumpers, including myself. Late the night before, we had demobbed off a fire into Grand Junction. After a short night's sleep, another fire was awaiting us. While waiting for the pilots to arrive, we had time to ready our gear and get a briefing. But I do recall we got a jump weather briefing that morning, and we were notified about the uh, impending weather front coming in in the afternoon. Talking about uh, the IC and, and uh, you know, he's, he uses jumpers, he's comfortable with jumpers, you know, make sure you do a good job. And uh, We went and flew the fire, and as we flew the fire, I had visions of another beautiful high mountain fire in the Aspens and the Rockies, and it was in the shale country, and it was Gamble's Oak, and it was a messy, sun-baked piece of crap, really, as far as a firefighter would look at it. Just looking at this big, ugly, smoldering pig, wondering what are we gonna do with this thing? I'm looking out there just going, how would we, you know, what sort of tactics is this? It's just hung up all over the place, kind of fingery. No real, uh, you know, heel, flanks, top of the fire was all on, on every side of this little mountain top. I, I remember getting a good look at the fire and because I could, you know, I could see where the, the guys, you know, I could see their yellow shirts from, you know, they were kind of strung out along that main ridge. And so I figured that, well, they, they were working on that side of the fire, you know, and now we just need to concentrate on this, this west side. Being a smoke jumper, you always see things from an aerial view. It's like, oh, that doesn't look that steep. Oh, it doesn't look that far. Then you get on the ground and it's like, wow, this is steep. Wow, this is far. After jump operations are completed, we tie in with the other jumpers who are starting the west flank line. The helicopter takes Blanco and Mackey on a recon, and for the first time, they see just how big the fire is. 
Since all our firefighters are already in place on the main ridge, they go with their plan. Mackie calls the jumpers and tells them to continue lining the west flank. And so we drug our feet and said, eh, I don't think we want to go down there. Why don't you come and talk to us first? Um, Don hits the ground and, and comes down and talks to us. And uh, I grabbed Don and uh, just took him off to the side. We walked down the hill a little ways in the brush and I said, okay, what do you see? What, what are you seeing when you're up there? He goes, well, you know, it looks pretty sparse down directly below us. And uh, it's not burning very hot and I think we can get around it. And uh, I'm like, you sure? You know, what's, you know, is there a safety zone below us? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's pretty open. I go, okay. And about that time, we had a tree up on top of the ridge flare up and uh, basically you guys and our guys kind of all jumped on it and started digging around it. And uh, he and I walked back up to the top. As we were pounding out those two trees on the top of the ridge, thousands of sparks are blowing off down slope on the back side, the shady side of the ridge, but it was just due to the timing and it was her morning and that side of the slope was still in shade and still damp from uh, moisture from the night, it was the only reason it didn't take off. I didn't express those concerns to anybody or articulate that. There was more experienced jumpers on the fire um, and I just kind of defer to them as far as, you know, making the decisions at that time. I just you know, plugged along with everybody else. And it didn't seem that like that bad of a plan because obviously the smoldering downhill creeping of the fire hadn't been checked. And so I went, okay, well, let's, let's get this thing corralled. It was kind of strange. Everybody just kind of fell into place and started down where that flag line was flanking the fire. There, there was reasons why we were dragging our feet and uh, it was because we didn't like it. And uh, we probably should have hung to our guns about that and didn't. You know, everything just kind of fell into place and folks went down the hill and went to work. As we first came off the top digging the, uh, the line downhill, it wasn't so bad. Uh, the brush was a uh, moderate height, but as we started getting like a couple hundred feet down, it, it soon became apparent that it was a lot bigger than it, than it looked. It was over our heads, 10, 12 feet tall. Even the most basic firefighters know you know, you start getting into some kind of vegetation that's as high as you are, as tall as you are, as, and that thick, you're gonna be more um, in tune to what the potential is for things to go wrong. And the only way out was the way that we were constructing and to go back up the hill. That was the only, then that was the only way to get to the safety zone up at H1. And the further we went, the further we were getting from our safety zone. It was just an, an uneasy feeling. It, this, uh, you know, we can do this, you know, let's just hurry up and get it done kind of thing. Besides a little bit of the more enclosed feeling with the heavy brush, again, there was no sense of alarm because the fire behavior itself was very benign at this time. The fire behavior was six inch flame lengths creeping through the dead leaf litter underneath the live Gamble's Oak. There was no flame creeping up the bark of the individual um, tree stems. There was no um, crinkling of the leaves, the green leaves hanging above in the canopy. There was no crinkling, there was no shrinking. There was no visible indicator that the fuel was being pre-treated at all. You know, a lot of us are from the Northwest and certainly for me, uh, brush, you know, I was just used to alder brush, and it, you know, the, it burns, the fire burns into twigs and leaves underneath that, but it doesn't, never really burns it. It's a, usually a place you can catch the fire. I mean, you know, we tried to burn it out a couple of times up on top by throwing a fusee into it, and it wouldn't burn. We just couldn't get it to burn, and so we were under the impression that, okay, this stuff's fairly safe now. It didn't burn then, and must have enough moisture in it that it's not gonna go now. But then on the other hand, there was this, uh, like, it just didn't feel right being that stuff. I'd never been in a California fire, but I was starting to wonder, is this that kind of stuff? To be honest, I didn't, I mean, I was a little un uncomfortable, but I wasn't, you know, so much so that I felt the need to speak up at that time. So one of the many mistakes we made, especially as workers, is we, uh, we didn't pass on our concerns uh, 
uh, you know, to, to Don Mackey. I think maybe if enough of us had uh, spoken up, he might have been swayed. And, you know, we just didn't like being in here. And, uh, but yet, that's just the way the culture was in. You know, you just kind of work away, grumble amongst yourselves. Uh, you know, Don would walk by and, hey, Don, how you doing? And he'd walk on and, oh, man, this is bad. And then what happened along here is the tree flared up. And the tree was actually on the other side of this spur ridge right here. Uh, so we couldn't see it, but we uh, could hear it. And it sounded pretty impressive. It sounded like a lot more than a tree. And it was sending up smoke. And that kind of confirmed with us along here. There's like, okay, this is our excuse to get out of here. When Mackie said, hey, let's pull out, you know, that uneasy feeling that I had definitely subsided as we were starting to walk back up. Longenecker happened to be out there right by it scouting the line. And he called back and said, no, it's okay. It's just a single tree. You know, called the helicopter to drop a bucket on it, you know, and then it calmed down. He said, well, let's go back in and keep at it. And then after that got cooled down, it's like, oh, now we got to go back down there. <laughs> and definitely more uneasy feeling. More grumbling. We're going back down. We're going even further into it. As the line construction continues, the flare-up tree becomes the stump, and nine Prineville hotshots join the West Flank Fire Line crew. We'd already put in 18, 20 days on fire, so we'd worked the bugs out of the crew. We took a day off. Uh, being close to Crater Lake, we just said, okay, let's, you know, geez, let's cruise on up there. A lot of the guys had never been there. Holy cow, you know, what a better place to spend been the, the 4th of July. Uh, camaraderie was just amazing. The, you know, everybody was happy, cheerful, looking forward to a great fire season. The following morning on the 5th, we got the word, okay, we're going to Colorado. So five hotshot crews flew down to uh, Grand Junction. There were lots of little things that didn't make sense even from the time that, that uh, from when we first got to Colorado. And some of them are pretty typical. You know, when we got to the, uh, got to the airport, um, there weren't any buses. You know, and then they weren't sure which fire we were going to go to. And then they had issues with feeding. And there was just some little confusion. It was kind of obvious that, that things were a little unsettled here. Yeah, we're going, okay, situation normal, you know. Next morning we got up and the bus had our name on it and it said Glenwood Springs, South Canyon. So we drove to Glenwood Springs on the bus, went to the local BLM office. We'd flown so we didn't have the usual complement of, of uh, Pulaski's and shovels. The lady in the office didn't have a clue uh, as to what to do to help us. Uh, she's going, oh, well, I didn't know you guys were coming. Um, no, you, you can't have those tools. That belongs to the Colorado River fire crew. They weren't expecting us, um, didn't quite know what to do with us, didn't have any tools. We had to scrounge around, break into the river guys' lockers to get some fire tools. Um, no, no, we, we didn't break into cash. As far as I know, I mean, you know, there's there's some things that happen that the crew does that maybe you're you're not aware of as as the superintendent. They told us to head into town, get some lunch, and halfway there we got turned around because they needed us on the fire. So there was a little confusion in the system. So we got up to the Canyon Creek Estates. You could see the fire uh, just laying there, not real active, pretty calm pretty innocent. My usual uh, MO is to get a recon, talk to as many folks as, as I can about what's going on, and look for myself. When I'd put the, the squads together and put the manifest together, I hadn't taken into account uh, some heavyweights that, that we had on the crew. The Hill Attack saw that and they swapped me out for Tammy Bickett. I balked and I 
wait a minute, what about my recon flight? And oh, we'll get it in, don't worry. So first five get, get flown over. John Kelso and Tammy Bickett, my squad bosses, they met right away with Blanco and made plans before I got there. Uh, helicopter comes back, we get loaded up, the IC is over there going, hurry up, hurry up. So we zipped over there and I didn't get a recon flight, which I think was crucial in the outcome. Uh, Blanco took me aside and kind of laid out what the, the plan was, he asked if my guys could go down with Mackey. It was too soon for me to even interject anything, you know, into that plan because I, I hadn't got a feel for, for anything yet. These jumpers have been here. Um, they've scouted the lay of the land. They know what's going on. It's, it's... So without my going down there, I trusted the IC and, and the, uh, the, well, Don Mackey, basically, um, that things are okay down there. The Primeville crew shuttle is interrupted to do bucket work. Blanco takes Shepard up to the H1 safety zone to show him the fire. No lookouts are posted and the train blocks views. Shepard searches for a better vantage while waiting for the second half of his crew to fly up. The first half of Primeville integrates with the west flank jumpers. Pretty excited because one of my rookie bros was on the Primeville hot shots and I was wondering if I'd see him. You know, I knew Kelso pretty well, John Kelso. And uh, he come walking in and everybody, you know, gave him the high fives and, and uh, said howdy to him. So we chatted and then we said, well, we'll, we'll get together at dinner time. And, uh, we talked and they, uh, they kind of fell into line. Routinely checked in with, with John down there on the radio. How's it going, John? Oh, great, you know, we're doing fine. Scouting the line, Longenecker is discovering the true scale of the area. Try to find an open area, you know, where it was, you know, it was kind of a little bit open where he could see anything. And it was like, we shouldn't have to go any further. Isn't this it? We've gone far enough. Oh, we got to go way over here. Back in Canyon Creek Estates, Brian Scholes and the second half of the Primeville Hotshots are observing the fire while waiting for the helicopter to finish bucket drops. So I'm looking up at something that doesn't make sense. You know, these folks are up here, you know, conducting an operation. They're cutting line, they're throwing buckets around, running saws, and way down below them, there's just smoke coming up. Well, that doesn't make sense, but they're doing it. They're doing it. On the west flank line, we had a major spur ridge coming off H1 that was blocking our view down canyon. Our line construction gets us out of the brush and to that spur ridge. And when you got on the lunch spot ridge, the vegetation changed with the aspect of that finger ridge. Looking uphill to the left was all Gamble's Oak. To the right was starting to become more open, pinion pine, um, with light grasses on the ground and a lot of mineral soil. And that's where, much to our surprise, the fire wasn't uh, generally following the contour anymore uh, as it had been on the other side. And we got to this ridge and all of a sudden there's smoke coming from way far down and we can't see, you can't even see where it's coming from. And I was ahead of everybody else. So I kind of, you know, looked the area over. And so I figured it'd be a good place to take a break because if uh, the fire did take off, we wouldn't have to go anywhere. The Missoula jumpers, they're kind of above me here. And the Prineville started filtering in below. And I was kind of sitting with uh, Dale Longnecker eating for a while. And then, uh, then he went off the scout. Longnecker dropped off one side to go scout for line because the, the fire edge on that side of the, um, incident was not very well defined. It was patchy. Um, there was, you know, a clump of trees on fire here, a uh, clump of trees over there that's not. It wasn't a clean edge as opposed to everything we had come down so far. 
As forecasted, the cold front is advancing into the Storm King Mountain area. Earlier in the day, a meteorologist for the National Weather Service in Grand Junction was alarmed by the 40-mile-an-hour wind gusts associated with the front as it passed outlying weather stations. Recognizing that this meant trouble for firefighters, he called all the dispatchers in the area, telling them to pass the updated warning to their staffed fires. The only district that failed to broadcast that warning was the Grand Junction District. After completing bucket work, the helicopter is refueled and flies the second half of the Prineville hotshots to the fire. It was interesting when I stepped out of the helicopter, the first thing that uh, you know that I noticed was when the helicopter flew away, I was expecting that wind to quit, no more rotor wash. And man, the wind is still howling, even after the helicopter left, kind of holds your heart hat on your head kind of a wind. And uh, that probably should have got my attention a little bit, but I'm ready to go to work. They were happy to be there, you know, happy to, to be productive and finally get rolling. I get out on the last load um, and uh, meet uh, uh, the IC and, and Tom Shepard, my crew boss, and uh, we get lined out with an assignment to brush out this ridge top, um, which makes sense to me. Um, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good place to hold, it's a good place to be, um, and, a, and, a, and a necessary thing uh, if we're going to have a safe place to operate. We assembled our gear and we received a briefing from Brian Scholes that uh, our mission was to brush out from H2 to H1. Tied in with Brian Scholes and we talked about you know, what our group was doing and how we we're going to kind of roll them into our operation. Jumpers call from below, they'd run out of water and that gave me an excuse to go down that fire line and see what we had. So they went to work and I continued at my lookout spot. But I'm uneasy. If I knew what it was that was bugging me, then I'd had a good reason to pull the plug. Generally, when you build a line right on the fire's edge, you're bringing your safety zone with you. There's no unburned fuel between you and the fire. What this fire had done was it had backed down through all of this brush on this hillside and the canopy of the brush was still intact. In effect, everyone on the fire had unburned fuel between the fire and where they were. Brian Scholes hikes down the west flank fire line with two five-gallon cubies of water. He meets Roger Roth at the stump. I ran into a smoke jumper who was uh, wrestling with a burning log. It was trying to go down the hill on him. And uh, so I set down the water and then we wrestled with the log a while and got it set in the bed so it wouldn't uh, wouldn't roll down and we chatted for a while and uh, at that point I intended to go on. I needed to see what was down the fire line, I needed to see what my folks were up to, I needed to see what was at the, the bottom of the hill. And um, the jumper said that he'd take the water. And about that time um, I heard from my folks up on the ridge top that uh, the wind had really picked up and that ridge top was a really important place. We really needed to hold that line up there and I thought it pretty likely in the wind that, uh, that we would get a spot fire over the ridge. So I had to decide, am I gonna go down the line to, the, to a problem that I, that I don't know about or am I gonna go back up the hill and deal with a problem that I'm pretty sure is gonna happen? And I went back up the hill. Myself and Don Mackey and Kevin Erickson, we had a little snack and that was our lunch spot. You're kind of sheltered down in those little draws and, and uh, you know, you didn't get a heck of a lot of wind on you. You could, you could tell that there were some winds starting to pick up a little bit afternoon and uh, um, it just didn't register on us about being a, you know, something big coming in. And uh, at this time, nobody had said anything about, you know, that I had heard about, you know, here comes some big cold front. But there was all those leaves and they were swirling around and the wind was picking up and smoke was picking up a little bit. And I, I was a little uncomfortable sitting and I don't know if it's just the nature that, you know, when you're doing something, you're not thinking that much about it, but um, feeling a little bit uncomfortable there and then wanting to just sort of get back up and get to work. So get a visual on things. Don headed back up toward where you guys were working and he asked, uh, uh, Sarah and I had to go back the other way and uh, make sure that line was good. The water had been bumped to where Roger Roth was working on the tree. And uh, I uh, 
I offered to take that back to the crew at that time, and he goes, "No, nah, I've, I've got fresh legs. I haven't, you know, I just got here." And, and uh, anyway, so we kind of argued about that, and he ended up winning, and uh, he left, and uh, so Sarah and I just kind of took our time walking back up out of there. This is a spot on the line I came down to just off the lunch spot ridge. There were embers and litter rolling out of this tree right here. Start putting in a cup trench, just just doing busy work until the until the decision came to figure out what the, our next plan of action was going to be with uh, getting around the fire. Uh, Mackie came by, chatted with him a little bit, and Tammy Bickett came by. She told me that the plan was that her crew was going to come in here and hold and maintain this part of the line, and so she said I could either go back to the lunch spot or just bump around the last person in her crew until I hit the first jumper that was along there. And I was gonna head back to the lunch spot, but then I uh, looked back up the line and all her people were already coming, coming down. It's pretty steep and narrow here. And so I said, uh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, just, you know, I'll just head down there. I only thought it was gonna be another 100 feet and it would be a lot further than I wanted to uh, to go back into that oak brush. Dale Longenecker is scouting across the double draws looking for the fire's edge. He had overheard some radio traffic that a busload of smoke jumpers was driving to the fire from Grand Junction. When they arrive, he thought, they could work in from the bottom and tie in with our line. That's kind of why I was, was here, was checking out to see what we had to do to keep it from backing down the hill there. He called us and said, you know, we've got another hot spot uh, area down here. We got to an area where uh, we could see Longnecker across the uh, gully. Communicated my apprehension with Dale, you know, talking with the jumpers uh, that were with me. Do we want to get more spread out? You know, we're having trouble holding what we have. We're leaving this area here to go down uh, further. I don't know if we should be doing this. You know, as we were having this conversation over the radio, kind of him hawing back and forth. Um, the, the, the fire activity above Dale on his aspect of the mountain um, definitely increased. There were some pine trees in that area and it was definitely getting up into the crowns with the flame and, and the heat coming off of it and then rolling back up the hill. And you know, so it's like at that point, oh man, this is just getting bigger. So I called for a, a bucket drop and I got one, but I think the winds must have been starting to pick up on the top, and they called for a bucket drop up there. It was just some of the key leadership folks that had radios. I think there was a lot of conversation happening on the inner crew nets. So a lot of the activity that was happening on the west side, I had no knowledge of. And we got a spot across the ridge line. I was working with um, Mackie and Sharon in the helicopter, so I asked him if he could free it up for a couple of bucket drops. Winds very strong coming over the ridge out of the west. Uh, the last uh, few minutes of us uh, cutting brush and swamping, the swampers were able to, to lift the brush and the wind would take it off the hill. We toss it up in the air and it disappears right into that east drainage. Uh, and we just, we're doing that over and over and it's, it's kind of fun. We're kind of having fun with it. So we received the order to, to move up to this spot where we tied in with Brian. And uh, the spot fire that the helicopter was working was right over here behind us. Uh, at this time, we were really aware of the wind, um, but I wasn't real concerned about it. It, it didn't, uh, there was still very little smoke coming off the fire. Um, I would categorize it as drift smoke at the time. Uh, I wasn't seeing any, any torching, any flame, um, just, just heavy winds and, and a little bit of smoke coming off the fire and we're, we're about ready to go in there and the helicopter you know, comes in to, to let a bucket go and it kind of disappears into the wind and, and at that time things are starting to happen. I don't think anybody on that fire was unaware of the potential that could happen. I think what would fool people, especially what took us by surprise, is how quick the change came. It was almost like a switch was flipped. 